turn the recording on. Okay. So go ahead, Ms. Jackson, and then introduce yourself, and then I will mute sure. when you're ready to present. Good morning, everyone, or, or afternoon, I should afternoon. say. Good I afternoon. am. Good thank afternoon. You. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm a, a attorney with legal counsel for the area. Uh, some of you may know uh, LCE. We are the nonprofit affiliate of AARP. Um, our, to receive our services, you do not need to be an AARP member. We simply fall under them, but not. Um, you don't have to be a member uh, to receive our free uh, civil legal services. We provide services in a variety of things. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about probate, wills, and uh, power of attorney, and a few other things. Um, just a little bit more about myself. I've been with the organization uh, since May of 2020. I've been practicing law, particularly uh, in elder law and estate planning since 2014. All right, we're gonna go on here. Uh, again, the mission of uh, Legal Counsel for the Elderly. We wanna empower, protect, and defend DC uh, seniors, particularly persons of low income. Uh, and we do that uh, in my area, um, again, dealing with probate and estate planning services. For legal counsel for the elderly over all services, not just my program, but for all of our services I'm going to talk about in a second, you should, should be 60 years um, of age or older um, for certain social security um, services and benefits, assistance with applying for those benefits. You should be 55 uh, years or older. You do need to be a resident of the district and um, there is an income uh, maximum because we are totally a nonprofit um, uh, organization. So we receive our funds through donors. So our donors tell us who we can uh, serve and, and also uh, what that income level should be, which is 200% or less of the federal poverty guidelines. And that equals to um, somewhere under uh, $30,000 or less a year. It does grow up, it does go up a little bit um, depending on the number of persons in your household. So for everyone that can see, um, I really just say, if you are a DC senior living in the district and you have some type of legal matter or questions or need some type of legal help that is not related to a criminal matter, I encourage you to call our hotline. It's at the end of this slide uh, presentation, but our hotline number is 202-434-3420. And you see that first, and, and I'll give that throughout the presentation. Uh, you see that first uh, bullet, uh, for the services that we provide our hotline. Uh, the number I just gave, that's to our hotline. That is the way into anybody that's gonna uh, receive our services. That's the beginning way. Uh, we know you don't like it. We don't like it, but we do gotta have some, some way to, to, to get you into, the, um, into accessing our services. So that's how we see if you qualify for free representation. However, um, you can call and get advice on anything. And if we can't take your case, we can either refer you to uh, attorneys who can provide services at reduced rates as our referral, or we can refer you to other organizations that may can assist with whatever your issue is. But um, whether you're a homeowner or you lease your home, uh, you can see we have a variety of services to assist seniors, tenant, landlord, assistant, any type of consumer issue, foreclosure, mortgage matters, senior Medicare patrol. These are this is a uh, staff that go out in the community 
uh, to provide um, information and presentations on ben uh, uh, Medicaid and Medicare benefits. There's an office of a DC long-term care ombudsman, very vital service. Uh, if you have a family member or you are in long-term care, you can you can call us for assistance if you have some issues with the care that you or your uh, loved one in in the long-term care facility is receiving. My particular uh, project is the economic and healthcare security team. So um, in my team, it's probably about 13 of us. Um, our senior uh, manager is Tina Nelson. Uh, that was the beautiful lady on the beginning of the slide. And then you can see the services that uh, fall under our project. Probate, life planning, we're gonna talk about that today, but also guardianship. Uh, if somebody needs a guardianship, um, or someone is seeking to, to uh, be appointed as a guardian. We have a homebound elderly project. This uh, is an attorney. Her sole mission is to go out and provide civil legal services to people, to seniors who are not, um, who have traveling or mobility uh, limitations. So you don't have to be confined to a bed, uh, but you have something that prevents you from, uh, makes it hard for you to, um, uh, travel outside of your home, then this is a project where, you, where if you qualify for the services, um, this attorney will come to your home to help you get those services. Public benefits, any veterans on the call or you know any veterans, uh, we can help with disability claims, survivors, uh, excuse me, surviving spouses of deceased veterans. You may call, uh, you may uh, be qualified for certain benefits. So that's the service we provide too. We also have a satellite office in each ward. Currently, our office uh, offices are not operational because we are between uh, attorneys to cover those, those programs. But that's some information I can share with Ms. Teresa to share with you all after the call of where those self-help offices are. So getting into what I'd like to, uh, I'm very excited to discuss uh, with you today uh, is probate and estate planning. So uh, just begin with what happens to your stuff uh, when we pass away? What happens to our stuff? So uh, we all know about, sometimes we have things that we need to pass on or that we would like to pass on um, to our loved ones after we pass away. And so probate is not the only way, it's one of the few ways to legally transfer assets of a deceased person uh, to another person. And I say legally because sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm, I know I have family members, you may all have family members or friends, uh, when a loved one has passed away, their estate has not gone through the probate process. It's just people just take over whatever that was, whether it was a car, furniture, or whatever, you know, they just kind of take it over. They continue to live in the house or the apartment if they're able to. But that doesn't mean they legally possess that property. So there's only a few legal ways that someone can possess a deceased person's uh, property. Let's see, can I go back here? All right. Um, um, many of my clients, uh, they when they come to legal counsel, legal counsel for the elderly, they are coming because something has forced them um, to do probate. Uh, many people try to avoid probate. Um, they just think it's a bad thing. They don't want to have anything to do with it. Um, so Probate is good. It has its good parts. And the only bad part um, where probate should be avoided is for the purpose of transferring property. And the reason that is, it's not to say that it shouldn't be used. It's just that there are other methods that we're going to discuss today to legally transfer deceased um, owners' properties to um, to their beneficiary or heir or whoever shall uh, inherit the property. So probate, you wanna avoid it for the purpose of passing on your property. However, it's good for many other things and we're gonna talk about that. 
Probate can be started with or without a will. I have this highlighted here because probate with the will, it is much simpler, it's faster and less costly than having to go through probate without the will of the deceased person. All right, so let's see, can I go to the next slide? Okay. I'm trying to move, move uh, my icons around so I can see. Um, what things must transfer by probate? And again, probate is simply a legal process to uh, handle a deceased person's affairs, uh, being their person, their actually physical body, as well as their the things they owned and dealing with the debts that they owed and any other thing that may come up that needs to be handled once the person has passed away. And I do wanna say that we all have estates. A person's estate um, is nothing more than the deceased person's assets, the things that they owned, O-W-N, and the things that they owed, O-W-E. So some of us have estates that um, have more things that we own than debt that we owe. Or some of us have very, will have very little in our estates. But everybody, when we pass away uh, 18 years or older, has an estate. So what estate property must pass through probate or requires that probate be started for the estate before the heirs or beneficiaries can become the legal owners? And we're talking about property such as houses, money in bank accounts, uh, unclaimed property, cars, things like that. Um, so probate involves only the things that are in the deceased person's name and also where that deceased person did not designate a beneficiary for that asset before he or she passed. Now, that's it. That is, those are the only property that must pass through probate. And so um, the things, conversely, or to say that another way, the things that can legally pass to someone uh, outside of the probate, uh, probate of the deceased person's estate is anything that this, the deceased person co-owned with right of survivorship or, or anything where the deceased person uh, designated a beneficiary of, uh, of that asset, meaning who is to get that asset upon his or her passing. And those are things that we know about like life insurance policies. Uh, if we designated a, uh, someone to receive our retirement or we created a trust, and then uh, there are a couple of other things I'm gonna talk about, um, a transfer on death deed that's available for homeowners. And then everybody, everybody that's on this call, everybody, doesn't matter if you have a penny or $10,000, uh, whatever you have, if you have a bank account, you should contact the bank to designate your POD, that's your payable on death. That allows whatever you have remaining uh, in the bank at the time of your death, uh, the bank can immediately issue it uh, to your name POD uh, outside of the probate process upon uh, proof of your death, such as your death uh, certificate. So if you want any, if you want any of your assets to pass outside of probate, meaning that your loved ones or whoever you want want to get it, if you want them to have the ability to get it um, immediately upon your death outside of probate, we must act now. You have to act now to do something um, to ensure that that property can immediately pass. And what you can do. Um, it, just like life insurance policy, you get a life insurance policy, you designate the beneficiary. If you have a pension, 
you call your employer or whoever handles your pension, your TSP, make sure you have a beneficiary designated. You can create a trust. You can create a transfer on death deed for homeowners and everybody can do that POD. So now, Ms. Teresa, I'd like to open it up for uh, a few questions at this point. Okay, so we would begin with uh, Ruby Fragger. Go ahead, Ruby, on mute and ask you a question. Ruby, on mute. Okay, I'll go with Sharon Blake. I'm going to unmute you, Sharon. Oh, God. Ask your question, Sharon. Can't get Sharon either. I'll go with Diane. Diane, on mute and ask you a question. Oh, Sharon, you finally unmuted. Go ahead, Sharon. Yes, yes ma'am. I have a question as to maybe a probate case that has been closed, but some things were done illegally before it was closed. What kind of options do I have about trying to get it reopened or what kind of options do I have about maybe fighting it, fighting the, the probate case and all together? Uh, hi, Ms. Sharon. Um, hi. I'm sorry that has happened to you. Um, to reopen, I'll uh, address it in a couple of parts. To reopen a probate matter, if it has been closed, um, there are court forms to complete and file. You can contact, uh, if, and if it, was this in the District of Columbia? Yes. You can contact the probate division which is located at 515 Fifth Street. Uh-huh. Uh, third floor. Yes. And um, you can go there to get the court forms to reopen a case, or you can um, you know, Google online and download it. But that okay. is that's just a procedural process. But what? to to address the the um, if you can, anybody can challenge at any time uh, probate proceedings whether you uh, think the personal representative is is not uh, performing appropriately you're challenging the will um, you're what you know you're just challenging something that is a, a process where you can file a motion with your complaint. Okay, I've done, I, I've yeah. done that. I did okay. go to her, I filed a motion. And I yeah. was told that, well, there were certain things in the probate paperwork that were not done, have been ordered by a judge to be done. And they weren't done before they closed the case. So I have gone down, I have filed a motion. And now I'm just waiting to hear, I guess it can take months for, for you to hear something, right? <laughs> And yeah, pro, yeah, not, uh, not, nothing moves fast in the probate process. Okay. So, uh, Ms. Blake, you and I, we can talk uh, offline uh, okay. after this. Uh, right. if, if there's time, I can check. Uh, or just so everybody knows, you can check the status of a probate matter. Uh, so if you filed a motion and want to see if there's any action, in addition to going down or calling, you can email probateinquiries at dcsc.gov. That's P as in Paul, R-O-B as in boy, A, T as in Tom, E, inquiries, I, N as in Nancy, Q, U, I, R, I, E as an egg S probate inquiries at dcsc.gov. You can also go online to the court's website and uh, do a case search lookup. And that, that's you can type in a, a party's name, um, and that way you can see what's going on with the docket. So we'll do okay, one more, we'll do one more question, Miss Teresa, and then uh, continue. Okay, we have Diane. Go ahead, Dr. Leach. Hello, Miss. I've got three questions. One is I designated everything to my son, which is not over $2,000 in my bank account. So uh, that's one question. So do I need a probate for that? 
question number two, my sister died years ago and we were trying to get her assets. Uh, you know, you just mentioned it about uh, finders, find people's assets, but we had so much trouble when we went down to court that the lady said it wasn't worth us trying. We had her birth certificate and all of that. And three, do I actually need a will just, just because I have under $2,000? Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Diane. Those are, those are all uh, very good questions. Um, for your son uh, and the bank account, that's awesome that you uh, created him uh, as you said you designated him to receive something. I don't know um, what whether you designated him as a beneficiary, a joint owner, or an actual payee on death. We, we joint owners. Okay, so um, if he is a joint owner, uh, that is a personal choice. So I want you and everybody on the call to know um, if you only want someone to have access to the money in the bank account after you pass away, you don't have to designate them as a joint owner. You know, whether you do or not is your personal preference. You can designate them as a POD, payee on death, P-A-Y-E-E, -E, payee on death. Okay. And you, you do that by calling the bank and letting them know you want to designate whomever as a POD. And that will assure that they get the money outside of the probate process upon a showing of your death, uh, such as with the death certificate. Right. The thing with joint owners, um, I would just say be, be careful um, with joint owners because sometimes we may do a joint owner thinking, okay, if they're the joint owner, they will get the money when I die. However, some banks still will freeze the money of a joint ownership account until the personal representative from probate steps forward. So uh, I would just say, talk to your bank, see what, you know, is it, is it enough that when you, when that the person is listed as a joint owner, is that enough that they can immediately get the rest of the funds or do you need to do something else such as designated, designate them as a POD? Right. For your sister, Miss Diane, um, it, that could that could very well be that um, I don't know what the um, value of your sister's assets are, but uh, um, I recommend probate because uh, we we were talking about the good things about probate. So you could you could you may need to probate your sister's estate for for many other things besides you know getting getting transfer of some property that she had and if she had if she died after 1995 if she died after July 1995 uh, she could uh, her estate could be a small estate matter which is for any uh, estate that's not valued at forty thousand dollars or more so it's forty thousand dollars or less and that is a, a less uh, complex probate procedure than the full large um, estate. So uh, what I recommend is calling uh, the hotline because um, we can assist you with the forms. We can provide uh, information that you need to com complete a small estate uh, process. That's for anybody that needs help with small estate. We do not represent you, but we can help you complete the forms, guide you through the process, uh, that type of thing. If that's if your sister died in DC and her property yeah. was in DC. And then the no, last- she didn't have any property, uh, but you know, uh, like a house and nothing. Right, like that. right. Oh, her okay. assets, her assets. Right, that's what I, yeah. Right. And then the last thing about a will. Yes, Miss Diane. Yes, everybody, everybody, Miss Diane, everybody, you need a will. Um, the will acts as a backup to all the measures that you may take 
um, this is this is what I'm saying. This is what LCE advocates. If you have a private attorney or you know others who say you've done all these things for prints transfer of property outside of probate, you don't need a will. I would just uh, clarify that to say you don't need a will for transfer of ownership if you've done some of the other things like Miss Diane did. But I am stressing to you today, ladies and gentlemen, everybody 18 or older needs a will for many other things that may come into play after you pass away besides simply transferring ownership of property. And we're going to get into some of that uh, later. Miss, uh, uh, may Ms. I Diane? ask one more question before you yes. go? Mm -hmm. My son is my only child. Yes, ma'am. But his father had two other children. Mm -hmm. If something happened to him, won't my family get it or will his sister and brother get it? We, uh, Miss Diane, I'm going to get into a uh, distribution of assets okay. with okay. and without a will a little bit later on. So I think I, uh, if I haven't asked, answered your question when I get to that part, uh, circle okay. back to me. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Okay, um, everyone, we're going to continue on with the presentation now. And I think this is where I left off. Yes. So, um, so what are some other reasons for probate besides transfer of property? Most of those other reasons have to do with the court designating the official authority for the probate. And the way that they do that in, in the District of Columbia, they issue a document called Letters of Administration. I don't know why there's an S on the end of letters, but it's just a one page document. And so to do many of the things that there, it's too many for me to uh, name or for any of us to think of why someone what action someone may need to take on our behalf once we pass away. I've listed a few things that someone may need to do, meaning that they're going to need that letters of administration because uh, whoever they need to deal with, they want to know that they're dealing with the official authority of the estate so that they are not held liable for dealing with bad actors or for dealing with someone without authority over the estate. So that's the significance of these letters of administration. Everybody you, that uh, your family members may come into contact with and need to do something either regarding your, your person or your, your, your things or just uh, some legal matter uh, after you have passed away concerning yourself the court, the government, uh, you know, who, who uh, property managers, mortgage companies, the utility bills, contractors, you know, to repair a house, or there, these people are all going to want to see the letters of administration, and the only way to get that is through the probate process. And this list is some of the things that uh, someone may need to do on your behalf once you pass away. Open up a safety uh, deposit box, attain your medical records, get access into your apartment or, or, or lease storage, um, transfer title of a car or sell a car, uh, get unclaimed property in your name. Uh, there could be incidents where you receive something uh, you know, from somebody else's estate or, and, or some type of settlement or some type of award. That money cannot be distributed until the personal representative is able to distribute it uh, on your behalf. Um, probate will also be needed if um, for your common, a common law spouse or significant other uh, where there was never a legal, uh, you know, a marriage that was, you know, legal according to the district laws um, you know, a marriage ceremony, in order to prove the status as a common law spouse, uh, that must be done through the probate process. 
So these things are, are, they can't be done unless probate has been started and a personal representative has been issued um, by, appointed by the court. Um, on my slide, it's running off the slide because I just wanted to show that the, the list goes on and on. It's, it's too many. I just named a few of them that have come up in the, with the clients that I've represented. So how can we help? How can legal counsel for the elderly help if you need to probate somebody's estate or after you pass away, um, your loved one uh, may need help to probate your estate. So in addition to those uh, LCE client criteria I spoke of earlier about the 60 years of age or older, um, the income levels and live in the district, the deceased person must have last, last live, lived in the district and he or she must have owned a property, uh, a home uh, in the district. That's for us to fully uh, represent you. So, that, so for me to be your attorney or one, of my, or one of my colleagues to be your attorney to do everything for you, um, there must be a house involved. And that's because, uh, as I said before, we're, we're nonprofit. Uh, the probate projects program is to help seniors age safely in place and to pass on generational wealth. So we do that by helping uh, the loved ones obtain title to the house and um, uh, then get some of those tax credits uh, for uh, as, a home, as a senior homeowner. But we still can provide you with guidance for small estate as well as answer questions about probate for small estate. Uh, so uh, we just can't fully represent you if it's not a large estate, meaning that there's a house involved. Um, also, the person that we represent uh, has to be eligible as a personal representative. A personal representative is, is only appointed in two ways. It's either named in someone's will, which is another, with the, which is another uh, really good reason why you should do a will, even if you've done other things for property to transfer outside of probate. And if there is no will naming who we want to be our personal representative over our estate, the court has a priority of, um, goes by the priority of the law. The law says who can be the personal representative and there's a priority order for that. It starts with the person named in the will, their surviving spouse or a common law spouse, that common law spouse is going to have to go to court and prove that there was a common law marriage. That's not an easy thing to do. So definitely for any um, seniors listening, if you have a significant other and you're not married, the only way to protect your common law spouse to ensure that he or she is appointed as your personal representative or that he or she receives anything that you want to give them, uh, the best thing to do is create a will um, for their, um, their inheritance, their ability to speak on your behalf um, once you pass away. Um, also, um, the client that we represent must be eligible to own the home. So for example, uh, if the home, if the deceased homeowner uh, co-owned the home with someone, but the person seeking um, our services um, was not that co-owner, then we wouldn't be able to represent them because there's no way for them to, to become the owner. Uh, also, if, if the deceased person named someone else to receive the home in his or her will, and the client seeking to become the owner is not the person named in the will to receive the home, again, we, we couldn't represent that person. And then if all these, uh, the client who is seeking representation, uh, they should uh, want to remain in the home. So that's our, that's our criteria for representing someone with full scope services. And this is just a, a list. The next slide is a list of all the things that we will do, but basically, we will cover everything uh, representing you for free, uh, everything that needs to be accomplished to probate the estate and obtain title to the home in your name. Um, and uh, as I said, for, for small estate, 
we, we aren't able to represent you, but we definitely uh, can assist you through that process with by filling out the forms and that type of thing. What else is down there? My uh, referrals. And then if you're over income for a large estate and, and the uh, matter is a large estate, uh, we can refer you if you like um, to attorneys who may be able to represent you at a reduced fee rate. All right. Okay, so next slide. All righty. Okay, this slide here, uh, just, it's just going through um, whether we represent you or you go through yourself um, or your loved ones go through themselves for probate of, of your estate after your passing, um, this is what they will need. If there is a will, um, the original will must be filed with the probate uh, documents. Um, the death certificate, it does not have to be the original death certificate. It, be a, it can be a copy of the death certificate. The death certificate is needed for the deceased homeowner, as well as if there were multiple homeowners on the deed, then all the um, deceased homeowner's death certificates are needed. If there was a will and it named beneficiaries who have passed away, then the dates of death of those beneficiaries, uh, that, that term is legatee. A legatee, a beneficiary, and heir, those are all inter interchangeable terms. They just mean the people who are inheriting. If there was a will, um, legally they are beneficiaries and legatees of the will. If there was no will, the law says who inherits. And that's kind of uh, what Miss Diane was asking. We'll get to that later. Those people, uh, legal term is called heirs at law or heirs. But we're talking about people that uh, inherit either through the will or by the law. And any deceased person who is entitled to inherit through the will or by the law, the client or the person um, our client or the person, if, if you're not our client, but just someone trying to probate, you do need to provide the dates of death for any deceased uh, beneficiaries, legacies, and heirs. You also to need to provide all their names and addresses of the people that you know. So let's say you've heard that, um, let's say that you are a daughter and you're probating your father's estate and you heard that your father had children, you know, um, in another relationship uh, apart from your mother, and that he has children, other children, you have other sisters and brothers, but you don't know that for sure. You're not responsible for uh, researching that and finding that out. Uh, the what you list on the probate forms are the known interested persons. And so these are the legacies, beneficiaries, heirs, and creditors of the deceased person, which is uh, any creditor that the deceased person owed $500 or more. All right. Um, also, um, our clients or anyone seeking to do probate will need to obtain the heirs signatures on court forms when the decedent died without a will. So that's another way, excuse me, another reason to do a will so that you can make this process easier for your loved ones, for whoever's going to probate your estate. Um, that, and that is so frustrating for clients because when probate has not been done for a long time, uh, many many, you know, generations and generations or years and years uh, since someone has died and then there's a need to probate, it is, it is a hard task to let alone find the names and addresses of the living heirs, but it becomes a, a even greater task to find names, excuse me, addresses of, of people, of heirs that are estranged from the family for whatever reason, as well as you know their dates of death, as well as their children, 
Um, if someone is deceased, trying to find their children and where they live, years, it could take years to find this information. I had a heartbreaking um, uh, news yesterday. I've been trying to help this client to find the date of death for a, 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 a beneficiary of a will and um, nobody knows it. She's been trying for about a year. We tried to help her and she's just not gonna be able to probate the um, her significant other's estate to get title to the house uh, because we can't, no, no one knows the date of death or whereabouts of, of one of these beneficiaries. Um, and so that's, that, was with, that was with a will. So there was a beneficiary, but the process can be equally or even harder when there is no will and just trying to find the names and addresses or dates of death of uh, the heirs. Then the other thing that the uh, client or person seeking to become the personal representative has to provide is information on the uh, information on the funeral expenses, who paid it, how much it was. And th all this information that I'm talking about is information because the court requires it on the probate forms. All right, this next slide is talking about the actual court forms. So first, and, and so you can see how probate can be, a comp it gets complicated even with no issues. But then if you kind of have family members that are estranged or you know, you have people that disagree and are not for bad reasons, but maybe they just disagree, uh, the process can be very complicated with just getting the information together that the family has to provide. And then here are all the court forms that are needed um, to be submitted to start the probate process. The main thing I really want you to see with this slide is the difference. You know, one looks shorter than the other. Test state is when someone dies with the will, there's a few forms to fill out and a fee. Interstate is when someone dies without a will. And so you can see there are three more forms uh, that are not only needed, but must be signed by every heir, the waiver of bond, a consent form, and assignment, possibly assignment of interest form. But the main thing also is if one or more of these heirs don't sign, of the heirs don't sign, then a bond may be needed. And that's going to increase the uh, filing fees and cost of probate. All right. So um, just talking about what if these heirs, excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Teresa, I wanted to pause before I go into uh, the next slide. Um, I'd like to pause for a couple of seconds, take any questions. Okay, we will then begin with Evelyn. Evelyn, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Evelyn? That's you, Evelyn, ask your question. Okay, I'll go to Michael Charles. Unmute and ask your question, Michael. Yes, uh, my question is, uh, do, do, is it a process where you have a limited amount of time to uh, try to get the, this probate stuff started. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Um, that's a really good question. Um, probate is different for every every uh, jurisdiction. So uh, dependent, and the jurisdiction is wherever the deceased person died. So, excuse me, I'm sorry, not died. It's where the deceased person last live. So you could have had a person that died in Maryland at a nursing home in Maryland or, or where something happened in Maryland that they passed while they were there, but they were a, a resident of the district. Welcome to Xfinity. You are the the uh, DC says that anyone with, with, uh, with that person's will, original will, must file it within 90 days of the date of death. That is something that is rarely, I'm not even gonna say ra rarely, it's never enforced. Uh, we have people that have not done, that are doing probate decades, 20 years, you know, 10 years, 18 years after the death of a deceased person. But uh, probate is definitely 
uh, easier to do, uh, or excuse me, it's, it's less headache for the person seeking to do probate if you can do it sooner. And I know that there's a grieving process, you know, so no one is expecting that someone dies and the next day you're in the courthouse doing probate. But as soon as you can emotionally, uh, you know, uh, you know, bring yourself to start the probate process, uh, that will be easier because there's less time that has passed, less people that may have died. You know, it's going to be less uh, information and, and work on um, the person doing probate if they could do it sooner rather than later. Thank you for that information and thank you for the information you have been giving us too. That's my pleasure, Mr. Michael. Is there another Any question? Ma'am, please. Is there another oh, question, Ms. Jackson? I have, I have a question. Yeah, but you, you would need to be in the queue. So I need, okay. I must follow the protocol. And so the next person given that opportunity is Linda. Linda, unmute. Unmute, Linda. She's not unmuting. So we'll go with Sid. Sid, unmute. Good question. Hi, good afternoon. And thank you for this information. Um, I'm calling to ask, what do you do? Uh, what was the thing about uh, to, to turn over a deed? And can you do that if, if you're married? And, and what if, you're, if your spouse survives you? You can't do that, right? Turn your property over. Mm-hmm. Hi, if you own sure. I'm sorry. No, no, I got you, Miss Sid. That, that's an uh, mm -hmm. awesome question for home homeowners in the district. Um, just a little bit about the transfer on death deed, T-O-D-D. -D. So some states and the District of Columbia, they permit a transfer on death deed. Unfortunately, it's not permitted in Maryland and Virginia yet. But if you're a DC homeowner, everybody should record this deed. If you own the home, home with multiple persons, it's still possible to record a transfer on death deed. You all just need to uh, be in agreement on once all the homeowners pass away that are listed on the deed, who you all want to have the house. Now, um, and it's not as urgent for multiple, co so for, it's not as urgent for a sole um, owner to file or create a transfer on death deed. Um, so it depends. So if you are a sole owner, then you should immediately file a transfer on death deed. But if you co-own the home with others, I'm saying that the uh, emergency, uh, the urgency is not as persistent because uh, your co-owner may inherit the house depending on how the deed is titled. A deed may be titled when there's one, when there's more than one owner, meaning co-owners. A deed may be titled or, or worded in such a way that when one of the co-owners die, his or her share automatically goes either to the spouse if they're married or automatically goes to the other co-owners if they're not married. So in those instances, you can do a transfer on death deed but it's not as urgent as if you only own the home, you know, if, if you are a single homeowner. Um, but it's not, so uh, to Ms. Sid's question, if you own the home with your spouse, um, that means that, in the, and you own it as what's called tenants by the entirety, that means that, that the surviving spouse is automatically going to become the sole owner of the house. Which so whichever of the spouse survives the other, but the both of you still can record a transfer on death deed, and given the given the home to whomever you want, um, you know, in the tra tragic instance that both of you pat both the homeowners pass away at the same time, or just having the assurance to know that when one passed away 
the other inherited the whole house and she or he does not have to uh, file a TODD because it's already recorded that when he or she dies, you know, their beneficiary that they named however long ago will then automatically be able to record a new deed in the beneficiary's name. The other way co-owners can own a home is either tenants in common or joint tenants with right of survivorship. So if you are a co-owner of a home, you should get a copy of your deed to know how it is titled. If you're married, it could be tenants by the entirety. Really, that's the only way. Um, there, I guess it could be tenants in common if you guys requested it, but typically it's tenants by the entirety, meaning that the surviving spouse gets it all. If it's other uh, co-owners who are not married, it's going to be joint tenants which means the deceased co-owners share automatically go to the other surviving co-owners all the way till it's only one surviving co-owner who's gonna inherit it all. Then the third and other way in the District of Columbia is tenants in common. That means that if there's three co-owners, if me, my brother, and my sister own a house together and we each own it as tenants in common, when I die, my share goes to the people I want it to go to. When my brother dies, his share goes to the people he wants it to go to. And when my sister dies, her share goes to her beneficiaries that she wants. Now, if we owned as joint tenants, then that would mean when I die, my share gets split between my brother and sister. Then when my brother died, uh, his share gets split between my sister. And then if my sister is the last survivor, then the whole house is gonna go to whomever she says. So uh, you, a TODD can be done if you own TI, as tenants in common, if you own a house as tenants in common with other persons, all the co-owners can do a transfer on death deed for their share. And their share can automatically go to whomever they say without uh, probate of their estate. If, if all the owners own as joint tenants, then they all can do a transfer on death deed to say who should get the house upon all of their death. Did, th did that answer, Miss Sid? Okay. Oh, okay, Miss Teresa, I'm gonna uh, yeah, move, move on. Move. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. And Miss Teresa, please keep me. Thank um, you. Yeah. With your, thank you, Miss Sid. Please give me like a five or ten minute uh, check when uh, before. Time's the, up. Yes, ma'am. Got it. Okay. Thank you. All righty. So now we we left off with what happens if we die without a will and our loved one needs to probate our estate, maybe not for transfer of property, but maybe they just want to get our medical records. Maybe they need to get access to the apartment um, where we had nobody else on the lease. It's some, one of these reasons um, that they're going to need to be to do probate, to get appointment as a personal representative, to do something related to our estate, but we die without a will. So if we die without a will and probate is needed, um, and we don't have all the heirs' signatures on those three forms that I talked about, excuse me, two of them are mandatory to avoid a bond, one of them is optional, the assignment of interest. Um, heirs don't, aren't, they are not required to sign the assignment of interest, but heirs do need to sign the consent to bond waiver and the um, waiver of personal representative, excuse me, the consent to appointment as personal representative and the waiver of personal representative bond um, in order for us, in order for the person seeking to do probate to proceed without paying a bond. And if, if we try to do that without those two forms, the court could reject the petition. 
uh, they might not, they might accept the petition and assign a case number, but they will, they will not allow us to transfer property or do what we need to do until we provide the missing information uh, from the heirs. Um, so we, we talked about some of that. And then ultimately, even if you pay the bond, and this has happened, this is, this is the present scenario. This is the scenario for three of my clients right now where their parents died, uh, they are siblings, the siblings are not in agreement, um, they're not signing off on the forms because the parents died without a will. So the sibling that wants to do probate um, is gonna have to pay a bond because the other siblings aren't willing to sign the air forms that need to be signed so they can proceed without a bond. But the issue is when it's time to transfer the house um, from their deceased parents' name to the siblings, without those heirs' cooperation on this document called a FP7C, that is the uh, real, real property recordation, excuse me, transfer, real property recordation and transfer tax form. Um, that document must be signed by all the heirs in order to avoid the fees that office and tax and revenue require when there is a change in ownership to record a new deed. I know I just said a lot there, but uh, the main thing is it's a bad thing to die without a will. You need all these heirs signatures um, to start probate. And there is a way around that you can pay a bond to, to complete probate. But even when there's a house invo involved, if you pay a bond, you still aren't gonna get ownership of the house if the heirs do not cooperate to sign the forms needed to record a new deed. So it's, it's better to have that will, especially if you have a house. And for some of these reasons that we talked about, if you don't have a house, and one of the main reasons is your loved one is not going to need to obtain signatures from the heirs. Um, they, they're still gonna need to provide names and addresses like we talked about, but they're not gonna need to chase down heirs to get signatures. All righty. So Ms. and Ms. Jackson, you have mm -hmm. five minutes. And okay. Then have 15 minutes for questions. It's okay. All five right. Five minutes will be two and then 15 minutes of questioning. Thank you, Ms. Teresa. So um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna just go through these next slides here so we can get to the questions. And so we talked about some of the reasons for a will. You remember that long list that was running off the page? But well, here's some more reasons to that a will can be useful. It's the only way you can ensure that your preference for burial or cremation is 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 there for the world to see, and your personal representative must follow it. You get to name your personal representative, not the court. Um, you can um, add a all wills uh, have a clause that weighs the requirement for that bond. Um, if probate uh, must be done, you can designate whether or not you want your organ to be don organs to be donated. You can name um, beneficiaries. You get to name your beneficiaries. So beneficiaries do not have to be blood related. They do not have to be, um, you know, our family members. Uh, they can be whoever we want. But if we die without a will then only blood relations can inherit according to the laws of that state, or in this case, DC. Also, just for, just for FYI, you cannot disinherit your spouse. Um, when we die without a will, the law says who inherits. So first, 100% um, goes to your sole heir. So whether you have a spouse and no children, or you have all children, or, or your parents and no children and no spouse, they get 100% of everything. Um, Ms. Diane's question. If you have a spouse, you guys have uh, children together, but your spouse have children, your, survive, your surviving spouse has children um, other than by you, 
then the surviving spouse gets a lesser percentage than, um, than if uh, he or she did not have children outside of your and his or her relationship. So in, if, so in other words, if there are stepchildren, when you die, your spouse is, is going to get uh, 50% um, and uh, your children will get 50%. If all your children are by your spouse, when you die, your spouse is going to get two thirds and your children is going to get a third. Your stepchildren do not inherit. Your stepchildren are not in entitled to legal, to uh, inherit from your estate. And uh, then, then you can see uh, if there are no children, um, but just parents, your spouse gets a third and your uh, parents get a fourth. Uh, I can't see what that last thing was down there. Uh, let's see what it said. Oh, um, if, there, if there are no relatives um, after what we have just gone through, then the government inherits. So that's another good reason to have a will simply because we don't want the government to get anything we have worked for. All right. Um, so I just say, you know, instead of thinking, do I need a will? Just do it. Just get it done. Especially if you can get it done for free. Um, it's a good. It's a good thing to have. It's not going to hurt you. It's not going to hurt your loved ones. And in fact, it may benefit them. So we talked about the will uh, transfer on death deeds. A trust is another thing that you can create while you're living um, so that your assets pass outside of probate. We talked about the transfer on death deed and the payee on death. These are all things you can do for your assets, your things to pass outside of probate. Hopefully we've talked enough about a will so that uh, you, even if you've done those things, you, do, you still wanna do a will. So, uh, for a will, it must be in writing, it must be signed and dated by you, it must have two witnesses, um, and it, uh, it can be, but it does not have to be notarized. Again, these are the things we talked about that you can do for your property to transfer outside of probate. And another thing that you can do while you are living is, uh, let me skip that slide, what did I do? Um, are create your powers of attorney documents. Powers of attorney documents are only valid while you are living. They lose all power after you pass away. So that's when your will and all these other things we've talked about um, um, take effect or have power. So before then, a part of estate planning, you wanna plan for if something happens to you, but you lose capacity. So the power of attorney documents help to uh, designate your agent for your end of life uh, medical treatment and also your financial and legal uh, matters. And as long as you live in, you can, as long as you're living and have same mind, you can change the documents at any time. Um, when you do a POA, a financial POA or healthcare uh, power of attorney document, you still may need to do power of attorney documents specific for the government or say the bank, your financial institution. Uh, so places such as Social Security Administration and Department of Veteran Affairs, your banks, uh, Office of Personal Management, even though you create your uh, healthcare POA, or your financial power of attorney document, you still may may need may need to do their specific one um, if you uh, if you receive a retirement pension from the Social Security Administration or from uh, the government or from Department of Veter Veteran Affairs. Um, that's just FYI. For a financial power of attorney document, again, it covers your legal transaction, basically. Anything that you can do while you are living, anything that you can do, that's the power of a, a financial power of attorney document. That's the power that you're given to your agent. And, um, but because it's such a powerful document, 
uh, you can limit the powers, you can scale it back some, you can dictate when their powers become effective. So you can say their power is only gonna be effective if, if you lose capacity, or you can choose for them to have the power immediately when you create the document, it's up to you. And also, like I say, you can scale back some of the powers. If you can limit how much power they have, like what types of powers that they have. But that document must be a writing, must be dated by you, it must be notarized. And um, it doesn't have to, but you can have two witnesses. The power of, the healthcare power of attorney document it is for your end of life treatment decisions. So you um, designate an agent who's gonna convey the decisions that you would convey if you could do so for yourself. And this is only if you are in the end of life situation where you cannot speak for yourself. Um, again, it must be in writing, it must be signed and dated by you. It must be witnessed and signed by two adults, but it does not have to be, but can be notarized. And then this last slide is just talking about uh, some of the end of life treatment decisions that you can make regarding your uh, an incurable illness, uh, uh, progressive functional deterioration or a coma. I'm gonna also state uh, if you wanna be an organ donor. So Ms. Teresa, I know I blew through that, but I am uh, open for any questions at this time. Okay, we're gonna go with to Cheryl Edwards. Go ahead, Cheryl. Yes, hi everyone, thank you. Good, good, um, good service. My question is, are there individuals or legal organizations who can stand in as payee on desk or personal representatives for an, for, like, to, like say for me, and do they charge me a fee to have them work on my behalf? There definitely are uh, individuals that can do that. Um, I usually um, that, and I wanna um, just stress that I'm talking about, for example, with the Social Security Administration, um, they have something called a payee representative and that person handles uh, is, a, is appointed to handle the um, benefits of the principal person. And um, I don't know about that. What I would recommend uh, is contacting our um, hotline to get more information on that. And so you can be up to date on what, if anything, they can charge and who is available to do that for you. Uh, I understand what you're saying. It, if, for example, it could be nursing homes, uh, it can be a professional. So yes, I know the answer is yes to that, but I don't know what they may charge or, or who all may can do it. Okay, and a will giving away your stuff and a will talking about end of life decision, those are two different entities. Yes, ma'am. So one is the living will sometimes called an advanced medical directive or advanced director. That is a document that has power while you are living and is only related to your end of life treatment decisions. Right. We at Legal Counsel for the Elderly, we combine that document with the healthcare power of attorney document. So you designate who can relay your decisions as well as you designate your decisions, we put those two together to work for you if you can't ever speak for yourself. But they don't have to be uh, together. You can just have a document to designate your healthcare power of attorney agent. You can have a sep separate living will document. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Our next question, I'm gonna take one from the chat. It is from Janine Horn. And the question is, do I need to update a will I did in 2011. Everything is the same since then. Uh, yes, ma'am. It's strictly your preference. If you have reviewed your will that was created several years ago um, and everything is fine, you don't need to change anything. You don't have to change anything. Uh, a good attorney will create a will for you so that even if you have changes that occur, it covers those changes. So there's no 
need to redo a will unless unless that's your preference to do so or or you actually have you know in the rare instance you have some type of incident that was so so different or so dramatic that you do need to change your will but that's a rare instance okay our next person is catalina go ahead and on new catalina you are next catalina on mute uh, meanwhile go ahead um i was wondering do, can you have more than one payee the pay on a demand from your bank mm -hmm. um i would say ma'am please call your bank um, to see um, what their procedures are. Each bank or institution may be different, but I, I uh, think it would be possible to say you want to give 50% to one person, 50% to another, or you want, you know, these three persons uh, to split, you know, whatever it may be. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so we have five minutes left of your time, Ms. Jackson. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to ask Gwendolyn, I've asked her to unmute, but I don't know, oh, there you are. Go ahead, Gwendolyn, ask your question. Yes, my question is, can you explain uh, an independent executor of an estate? Uh, yes, ma'am, uh, I, I believe what you're referring to um is the title of the person that is going to be over the estate i i use you know in the slide presentation and as i've been talking i've been saying calling that person a personal representative it it the term can vary from district to district because each district uh, state and the district of columbia they each have their own probate rules so for DC, uh, the person over the estate is called the personal representative. In uh, some other places, it may be called an executor. In some other places, it might be called the administrator, but the roles are the same. In some places, if a person who is entitled by law, by the will or by law to probate the estate does not step forward to probate the estate, there can be other people who are appointed by the court to be appointed as a personal representative. These are court appointed executors or court appointed administrators or court appointed um, uh, personal representative, normally attorneys. Um, when a creditor or someone who needs some action to, that, to be done and of course, we know that action can only be done by a personal representative. So there'll be somebody other than family members that may step forward to the court to probate an estate. So and a, uh, a personal representative or executor administrator can be appointed so that that person can do not only probate the estate, but address whatever issue uh, this third party wants addressed. That happens a lot with mortgage companies who are trying to foreclose on properties or creditor, creditors who are owed a large sum of money and they're trying to collect from the estate. Okay, all right. So we have time for one more question and we're going to go to Louise Alamore. Go ahead, Louise, on mute. Louise, on mute, you've got just one minute. Okay, if Louise is not, Yvonne, go ahead, Yvonne, Irvin, on mute. Oh, uh, thank you, um, Teresa. Uh, Ms. Jackson, I um, thank you for all this information. Pleasure. I have filed a transfer on death deed. Um, it's I'm been, okay now. Nice. can you hear me? Go yes, ahead, Yvonne. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's been assigned the number and all of that. Great. Now, I've done a, um, a uh, will, does that is that filed with the um, recorder of deeds or does it have to be filed? I've shared it with, I have a son and a daughter and of course I've shared it with them. Do I need to go through any other uh, documentation? 
No, no, Miss Yvonne, um, congratulations to you on all those things you've done for doing the estate planning in the District of Columbia. Uh, the district does not yet allow uh, persons to file their original will while they're living. So you want to do what you've exactly what you've done. Let your children know where your original will is kept. They will need yes. the original will. Let them know where it's kept or give it to them if you trust them so that they can file it um, when needed um, after your passing. In 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 Maryland though, they do allow uh, uh, Maryland residents to record their will while they are living so that the personal representative doesn't need to do it. I don't know about Virginia. Okay, well, that was my concern because uh, they, my son and my daughter both know my wishes with respect to my uh, estate. Oh, okay. And I just needed to know if I needed to uh, yeah. file it with, you know, yeah. some agency of the government. Keep, keep your ears uh open for any changes in the dc probate rules there's been a big push by the legal community to get the probate division to allow dc residents to record their will um you know while they are living but right now they you can't well thank you ever so much thank you miss mm -hmm. james for this uh session Hello. okay Hello. go this ahead is Louise. You're, you'll be the yes. last person so go ahead. It was it was difficult for me to unmute because you didn't allow me to. That's why. But anyways, the question I have is: if you have a, a trust, do you still need a will? Uh, thank you, Miss Louise. I, I'm sorry you had uh, trouble um, getting your question through. But yes, ma'am, I encourage anyone that has done a trust to still do a will. A trust is beautiful because it's going to avoid that bad part of probate. We want to avoid mm -hmm. assets having to go through the probate process in order for our beneficiaries to, to benefit from that asset. So any, mm -hmm. it's great you've done a trust. Um, however, I still say do the will because it's a, it, it, it is a cover. It is a covering. It is an additional layer for your probate in the event that your estate has to be probated for some other reason besides uh, transferring your property. And so by having a will, you get to name your personal representative to handle your affairs, affairs even though you've already discussed it with whomever, by, by, uh, by doing the will and naming the personal representative in the will, the rest of the world knows, the legal world knows who you wanted as your personal representative. And it's gonna make it easier for them to handle any of those things that we can't begin to think of that may come up once we pass away. So for reasons other than transfer property, we want to have a will. And my other question is, um, if I own a townhouse in Florida, how do I get to if I want to put that in a trust also, who do I use? The attorney in DC will do it, or I have to go to Florida. I don't know anybody yeah. there really. But yeah, one it, yes, it uh, it, it that is uh, kind of challenging. What I recommend you can you do want to make sure your trust is uh, according to the um laws of that of Florida, whatever okay. jurisdiction. Um, what I would recommend, number one, you call our hotline to ask that question, but mm -hmm. what I what I to get a more thorough answer. But the other thing you can do is call the Florida State Bar Association or mm -hmm. Google Google any uh, Florida civil legal services in Florida uh, mm -hmm. to for help with uh, creating a, a trust for property in Florida. Uh, Florida. You just mm -hmm. want to make sure you, uh, I I don't I don't want to go into that because I don't want to steer you in the, in the wrong direction, but um, call the hotline to ask that question for more detailed question uh, response. But that's something you can do also whenever, whenever you're trying to find an attorney in another state, you don't know anything. A good place to start is with the state bar association for that state. Mm -hmm. okay. And so so what's your outline number? Is that the- we'll, we'll repeat that. We'll, 
-hmm. we're going to wrap up with the hotline number. Okay. Okay. So at this moment, uh, we have to thank Ms. Jackson for such an informative presentation. Um, I mean, there was so much involved, mm -hmm. a lot of data here. Uh, at this point, those unanswered questions, I would highly advise you to call the hotline and I'll ask Ms. Jackson to repeat that hotline number for those that are still have questions. Yes, the hotline number is 202 Three seven seven, Miss uh, Teresa. I just oh. want to I just want to say really quickly. Um, uh, as I was thinking about the question about will changes, um, you do want to change your will for certain things. If you get married, uh, you have a new spouse, but if it's just you know that um, anything like that where you need to change the name of somebody, then uh, you do want to do a new will, or, or you can do what's called a codicil, which is where you just uh, add, a, add, it's like an addendum. You don't redo your whole will. It's just a codicil to say, hey, my beneficiary for that is now this person. Okay, well, thank you, Ms. Jackson. Um, it's been a wonderful um, presentation. I'd like our seniors to say thank you, show your appreciation at this moment. You can on mute. Everybody should be able to do so. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. 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 Thank you Thank you. 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 But very good, very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Bye, bye bye. So we're going to say goodbye now to Miss Jackson, and we'll bring our presentation to an end. Miss Jackson, again, we would love to have you back in a, perhaps another sixty days from now to end up with what you weren't able to share and answer those questions that are still lingering. Yeah. My but pleasure. Uh, I, I would be sending you some sort of email or whatever requesting your attention. It is just a wonderful, most informative um, presentation. I'm sure all of us, all of us, this including myself, needed. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye guys. bye. Okay, everyone. I am going to say goodbye for this afternoon. I thank you for your undivided attention. You, uh, the behavior was exceptional. I wish we could have this every day, <laughs> but that's not the case. So tomorrow we're gonna be looking at module one again, uh, for, especially for those newcomers. Um, module one is pretty, it's lightweight. It's about what actually um, took place in your one-on-one. -on -one. So tune in if you'd like to be enlightened on what actually happened when you did your one-on-one -on -one training. For those of you who don't need that, then I would say tune in on Thursday for Cyber Senior presentation, which is how to download applications that are safe. In other words, we get a lot of questions about, I'm not sure about downloading apps. Um, is it safe to do so? It is not safe to download apps unless you're absolutely sure about what you are downloading. Apps come with malware, okay? So you've got to know how to and how to read it in doing so. So that's what Thursday's presentation will be on. And then, of course, on Friday, we'll be looking at module uh, two. So thank everyone. Wish you all the best, pleasant evening, and see most of you tomorrow. God bless. Bye-bye.